Good morning, friends, and, and welcome back. Uh, today is Saturday, April 2nd, and I just wanted to make a quick morning chat video. I've uh, got a busy day planned today. I've got several things I've, I've got to do, run a bunch of errands, and I believe my wife wants to go to see a movie today, although I don't know what movie we're going to see. So that'll be a surprise for me. Uh, so, yeah, it's going to be a busy morning, but uh, I did want to check in. I, I missed last week, uh, the Easter holiday last week just had me fairly busy, and I just didn't have time to, to really get together uh, a video for, for the weekend. I hope you all did have a, a very uh, happy and pleasant and, and blessed Easter, uh, if, 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 you're, uh, if you celebrate Easter. Uh, it's a great holiday for, uh, for Christians, and uh, you know, I, I'm a, uh, a Roman Catholic, and it's one of my favorite holidays. Uh, actually, I, I like Easter a bit more than than Christmas, to be honest. I think it's uh, much more meaningful to the faith. And the other thing about it is that it's not as commercialized as, as Christmas. Uh, so you can actually focus on the, on the true meaning of the holiday. Um, it's it's also another one of these holidays that is uh, shared, and, and in a sense is shared uh, even a bit more broadly. I mean, you know, we, we certainly share it with, uh, with, with all Non, well, we share the holiday with all Christians. Uh, the Orthodox celebrate it at a different time of, of year sometimes, and right now there's a large separation uh, this year because the, 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 the way Easter is defined, it actually moves on the calendar every year. So there's, I think, almost a full month between the, um, the, the, the Roman Rite and, and, and the Orthodox Rite. Um, but certainly we all have a sense of the importance of Easter. And, and I think that's a good thing. But this is also a case where you know, it ties in very closely with the, uh, the Jewish Passover. And while we, we, we celebrate Easter for a very different reason than the Jews are, are celebrating Passover, it is a time um, when, when the two faiths can, can sort of come together and, and, and talk about those differences in a way that helps build respect because we do have a mutual understanding of the meaning of, of the holidays. So, sorry, I didn't want to turn this into a... <laughs> a religious babble, but uh, I, I, it is something I think about a lot at, at this time of year. And, uh, you know, I think it's just one of the blessings that we have that these sort of ecumenical moments are built in, in, in many ways into our faith. Uh, we, we need to look for those, because this is clearly not a time when we need to be uh, separating based on faith. We need to be uh, finding strength in, in, in the, the threads that tie us together, even though we may have really different beliefs in, in, you know, in, in the minutiae. In the large picture, there's a lot more that brings us together, and I, I think current events tell us that this is a time when we need to be looking at those that sort of global view of, of all of our faiths, and, and even those of us that, uh, that that consider themselves to to not profess a faith, because you know, in a sense, it's the same thing. You just are choosing to believe in in a different force. Okay, let's leave that behind because today what I wanted to, to, to do is, is actually have a pipe. I've got my uh, favorite Seven Ellie, this little Seven Ellie bent pot. Um, these are wonderful pipes. I've been looking for more of them, and they're, they're difficult to find on the estate um, market, or at least the restorable estate market. The shape, this is a 622 Bruna, and uh, I, I really love this pipe. So if you see any of these, don't buy them because they're mine. And in the pipe, I'm, I haven't packed it yet because I, I'm actually almost out of this. I've gone through this two-ounce sample in, in record time. This is a LJ Peretti uh, blend, and the blend is actually it's just labeled Cuban here on the bag, but this is called Cuban Mixture. And as I'm packing the pipe, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about this, this blend uh, in, directly from the Peretti website. This is one of their older, oldest, or it is their oldest blend. It was blended first at the, what they say is the turn of the century, which means uh, the turn of the 20th century, not, not just a few years back, but uh, a hundred and a few years back. Uh, it has also been, I don't think it was on the Peretti website, but I've seen in tobacco reviews or somewhere it's considered to be the oldest uh, American blend. Uh, I don't know for certain if that's true, but it's an interesting little factoid. Um, now, Peretti, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's a Boston-based tobacconist. Uh, they actually started off as a uh, cigar, uh, both manufacturer and importer, and at the time were known for, I think the original name of Peretti was the Cuban Cigar 
factory or something like that. Um, so they were known for their Cuban cigars at the time when uh, Cuban mixture was blended, and it was probably, I'm making this up, but I would guess it was in some way designed to be a crossover of sorts for the folks that were coming into Prairie for cigars but might have wanted to try pipe tobacco or vice versa, I guess. Uh, it does contain cigar leaf. It's actually a very complex blend. Uh, according to Peretti, it contains seven different tobaccos, and they do not on their website list those seven tobaccos, but if you go over to Tobacco Review, uh, somehow or the other, Tobacco Review always ha has all the components listed, which leads me to believe that they're often wrong, and I have often tried to make my experience match up with Tobacco Reviews and failed miserably. So I don't know where those components come from, but for the sake of just saying something about them, uh, tobacco Review says that this contains Burley, Cavendish, uh, Cigar Leaf, Kentucky, Latakia, Maryland, and Oriental slash Turkey, and Virginia. Now, if you add those up or if you count it along, that's eight tobaccos, and Brady says it's seven, so I don't know if they got an extra one there. Uh, and I'm not counting Oriental slash Turkey as two. That's, I'm still counting that as one. They still have eight. Now the Cavendish, if there is Cavendish in this, it's not a dark black Cavendish. It's it's a it's a golden Cavendish. Um, they, tobacco Reviews also says that it is flavored with mint, and I cannot detect anything of mint uh, either in the the note on the tobacco, you know, from the pouch or yeah, I'm not getting any mint at all, or in in the smoke. You know, there's no detectable mint. Um, it is topped. There's no question about that, but it's a well done topping. It, it appears to be a natural topping. I'm getting no chemical flavor from it. Uh, I think it's molasses. Uh, it's definitely one of the older flavors. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing, it's not anise, it's nothing overpowering, and it's sweet, and it's deep, and I, I really think it's molasses. Uh, it works very well with this. I'm not typically a fan of top tobaccos, but this is one that I, that I like a lot. Now, to get, to get into, well, let, let me light this up so that I at least have some references I'm smoking it. He says, hoping the lighter lights. You know, it's... I'll tell you off the bat that the first two or three times I smoked this, I couldn't understand why anybody would buy this tobacco. Um, by the fourth smoke, so after the third smoke, I was thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna smoke five, maybe six bowls of this and be done with it. But I, I like to get up to at least five or six bowls because sometimes surprising things happen. By about the fourth bowl, I was starting to d try to decide whether I wanted to make my next order eight ounces or a full pound. It's the strangest experience I've had with learning about a tobacco. The reason being... When you first light it up, it, to my palate, is harsh and very, uh, very monochrome, very single flavor um, profile. And it just is harsh and it's not pleasant. It's almost like, um, I hate to say this because it's not, there's nothing bad about this in the end, but on the first light, it's almost like you're lighting up like a White Owl cigar or something like that, you know, a machine made. Uh, drugstore cigar, and you know, there are folks that love those cigars. I, I used to smoke them. I still will occasionally in a pinch, so, but to have a full pipe of this and for it to be a premium tobacco, huh? But after a few puffs, this really starts to mellow out. and it becomes something absolutely wonderful. Now the problem I've had is that it becomes something absolutely wonderful 
maybe 70% of the time. And the other 30% of the time, it doesn't. It just stays like that initial light. And I cannot figure out, and I've been through, this was a full two ounce sample, and I probably have maybe one or two bowls left of this. So I've smoked a lot of this. Uh, and in record time, because when it's good, it is fantastically good. It doesn't seem to depend on the shape of the pipe. I've tried to be very consistent with my packing. I've tried a couple of different methods of packing. And so far, nothing has really clicked in terms of what it is, that, what that magical thing is that makes this work. This seems to be nice now. So it's a good example of, of a tobacco that you really have to stick with for a bit to get to understand it. And I've had that experience before. Um, I don't remember if it was Haunted Bookshop or Old Joe Kranz, one of those. I had to go through like, almost the full two ounce, um, initial two ounces that I ordered before that one clicked with me, and it clicked magically. It was, it was Haunted Bookshop, actually. Uh, it just, I was smoking it one night, and it just... I just, my God, this is fantastic, what, what happened. And it's always been fantastic after that. So I don't know, you know, just something about the way I was tasting those tobaccos, the way I was attending to them, changed. This isn't like that. This is, there's something about the way it's smoking, and I, I really can't get it, uh, understand what it is. But it was well worth putting up with those uh, first few smokes. And now I'm going to probably go through another two to four ounces just to try to figure out how I can be more consistent with, with obtaining the, the, the flavor, and I hope I can be, uh, because it's really wonderful. So the, the topping is there, uh, and it, it's there one, once that initial harshness mellows out, it, it comes forward. It's not, um, like I said, it's not a chemical harshness, it's not something that you're going to uh, not want to uh, have on your tobacco, it blends very well with the, flavor, with the flavoring of the tobaccos. Um, and I think that's true in part because the most forward flavor that I get out of this is burley. But don't panic if you're if you're a burley hater, because it's it's a very very well balanced blend. Where the well, I just I just got that molasses very <laughs> very strong, almost like I was biting into a caramel or something. Uh, it, but it's not a sweet. Aromatic. It's, I, would, I would not call this an aromatic. It just has a topping. Um, the burley and the molasses combine very well, and that's a common uh, uh, combination uh, in, in uh, tobaccos, uh, at least tobaccos of that era. Um, the next thing that really seems to dominate this, from, uh, not, nothing dominates, but the, the, the sort of the next you know, the burleys here with that molasses topping and then coming in right about here is the uh, the Kentucky and the the Kentucky and sorry I made notes because yeah the cigar leaf the cigar leaf is an important part of this um, and it does seem to have a fair amount a detectable amount of cigar leaf that's providing a nice solid deep base foundation for everything and the burleys like riding on top of that with that molasses topping and then everything else is coming in, and it's coming in in a very nicely balanced way. So you get a little bit of smokiness from the Latakia. It's barely detectable. The Orientals are there, uh, again, barely detectable, but they're, they're, they're adding some sweetness and some, some uh, supporting smokiness to that spiciness of the, the Kentucky. Um, I'm not real good at pulling out things like Maryland. I, I, have, I think Maryland's just another Virginia, at least to me it is. Um, and then the Virginias are, you know, they might be there. there there's, there's definitely sweetness to this. I don't know if that's coming from the molasses or from the Virginias. But it just all melds together so nicely. And uh, when this tobacco is on, for me, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, it reminds me in some ways of some of the things I said about Weybridge a, a few uh, months back when I reviewed that in, in terms of the, the, just the quality of the melding of these flavors. Another one, if you haven't tried... Um, John Patton's, I think it's Oriental Dusk, uh, which you can get from Four Noggins. Uh, it, was, it was not being made for a while, but then he decided to remake it. Richard Four Noggins. Oriental Dusk is another one of these just really well-balanced, well, 
melded tobaccos that I, I just love because the flavors are all there and you can go looking for them. But if you just want to have a relaxing smoke and, and read a book, it still is a fantastic uh, smoke. So LJ Peretti Cuban Mixture, I highly recommend it if you're the kind of person that is willing to be a bit persistent and make sure you get at least through two ounces before you make up your mind. Uh, I think you'll be pleased. Um, if, if what I described to you is the kind of smoking experience you think you'd like. Uh, if you're somebody that just wants to, you know, pack the pipe and run, you may want to stay away from this one. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly am enjoying the tobacco. And I do think I'll go back for probably a, a four ounce sample next and go through that and see how it, uh, how it works. So in other news, um, the corn cob pipe series is, is coming along nicely and I've gotten a lot of good feedback from that, so I thank you for that. Um, I will be posting tomorrow a uh, video on uh, taking a, getting an ebonite blank for, for the um, for a corn cob pipe and actually fitting it to the to the pipe and sorry my dog's being vocal uh, fitting it to the pipe and then shaping it and they're basically putting a new stem made from ebonite onto your corn cob pipe and the nice thing about that video is it's the same procedure that you would you could use to put a new stem onto a briar pipe uh, I spent a lot of time trying to come up with a way to do that that people that don't have workshops and don't have metal lathes and things like that might be able to do it. Maybe not to the same quality, but at least a hobbyist would have a way to do it. And I think I've come up with a, with a method that'll work. Um, you know, it's, if you got a lathe, you would never use it. But if you don't and you just want to do a couple of stems, I think it'll be helpful. Um, and then the last video in that series is going to be on a complete overhaul of a corn cob pipe, turning it into something completely new. And both both of those videos are turning out to be quite long. The second one is not done yet. I have completed the stem video. They were really long. They were like uh, hitting 40 minutes, and I decided to cut them into two just to make it manageable for folks. Um, I've also completed the um, the um, Benchmade Jumbo series that I was posting on Wednesday nights, and I don't yet have another Briar Pipe series to, to plug in on Wednesday. So what I think I'm going to do is, since the next the last two corn cob videos are going to be two parters. I'm going to post those on Wednesday and Sunday. So you'll get part one of stem fitting tomorrow, and then part two of stem fitting will come out on Wednesday. And then I'll do the same with uh, the the um, I don't know what to call it, but uh, I'm just going to call it the cob foolery mod for now. Uh, that'll be uh, Wednesday, the following Wednesday, and then the following Sunday we'll complete the corn cob pipe series. Like I said, I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that, so I think I might start doing some corn cob pipe modification videos, uh, more, more along the lines of the last videos in this series, which you haven't seen yet, but, you know, turning the pipe into something different. Uh, so we'll, we'll just see how that goes over time, and I've got quite a few briars lined up for restoration. So hopefully you'll, uh, you'll be enjoying some of those, and of course I'll you know, try to be continuing these weekend uh, chats as much as I can. So I'm going a bit long here, but I did want to spend some time with you and, and talk about the uh, Cuban mixture because I, I do highly recommend this tobacco. If, if you're someone that wants to spend some time with the tobacco and get to know it, it it's good stuff. Okay, I've got to run. Uh, I've got a bunch of things to do today, and I'm sure you do too. So until uh, next time we talk, I, I hope you're all doing well and take care of yourselves. And I will look forward to talking to you all again very soon. Goodbye now.